Thank you all for joining us today for the opening of The Other Side of Silence, Harayer Sarkisian's first mid-career survey exhibition and the most expansive presentation of his work to date, reflecting the ex extensiveness of his practice through the mediums of photography, moving image, sound, sculpture, and installation. Sarkisian explores histories of disappearance, the architecture of violence, and the potential of the medium of photography itself. This exhibition presents major works from the last 15 years and includes Last Seen, a Sharjah Art Foundation commission. It is our great pleasure this evening to host a conversation between Harayer Sarkisian and the exhibition's curator, Dr. Amal Kharif, Sharjah Art Foundation's director of collections and senior curator. Tonight's discussion will reflect on Sarkisian's newly commissioned works as well as his journey as an artist, exploring themes of memory, history, loss, and restitution. We will have some time at the end for a brief audience Q&A, and afterwards I invite you to join us for the signing of Harayer Sarkisian's first major monograph, published by Bonniers Constal in collaboration with Lens Press. I would like to take this opportunity to thank our partners and co-organizers of this exhibition, Bonnier Constal in, Stonk in Stockholm and Bonifantan in Maastricht, as well as the exhibition co-curators, Dr. Theodor Remberg, as artistic director, Bonniers Constal, and Stein Hoots, Artistic Director, the Bonafontan. Following its presentation in Sharjah, the exhibition will travel to these institutions in 2022 and 2023. Now please join me in welcoming Harayr Sarkisian and Dr. Amar Khalif. Does someone have the magic clicker that, um, thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you this evening on the occasion, as um, uh, Noura Al-Ma'ala mentioned, of uh, Harar Sarkisian's first mid-career survey. Thank you, Noura, for the introduction, and thank you, all of you, for being here. It's uh, rather unusual. I've to be um, with you all. This is the first time I think in years that some of us have sat in, I don't know, last time we sat in front of people together was in Texas more than two years ago. And I think that was the last time that we, that we did so. So um, just to give some context about this conversation, what Herrera and I have had a conversation for many years, but that conversation actually was seated in Sharjah, where the artist first exhibited a work called Execution Squares in 2009, which became part of the newly formed found Sharjah Art Foundation's collection, and was also featured in Sharjah Biennial 10. And our relationship around Sharjah Art Foundation began when I was a guest curator of the last Sharjah Biennial and invited the artist to show another work which is now part of the collection called Final Flight, uh, which uh, looks at uh, histories of restitution and imagination. And it was at that opening that uh, Sheikha Hurek Qasimi invited um, Harar to um, prepare and begin this journey, which has taken us two and a half years to get to this point. And what we wanted to do this evening with you is to go through a series of images and really give the stage over to Sarkisian to give us some deep context, and I might do some probing in that regard as well. Um, uh, we have a, a, a lot, we've, we've talked in very many different formats, so let's see how this one works out for us. Uh, but of, of course, the themes are, the m themes of memory, history, and photography, of course, are inherent within the context of, of the show. Do you want to say anything, Harar, before we begin? Uh, yeah, I would like first to thank Sheikh Ahur al Qasimi for giving me this amazing uh, opportunity and also uh, for the first time having such a, a scale of uh, platform to show my work. Uh, and this is for me, it's, it has a, a very big uh, meaning that uh, I don't think I will ever forget to have uh, this chance to show 
uh, what I have done in these past careers by Sharjah Art Foundation, and I'm really grateful for this. And I would like also to thank uh, uh, Omar for uh, this bumpy journey we had for uh, two and a half years, talking about really bumpy. difficult topics uh, when it comes to work. Uh, and you've been always there. And also, uh, <clears throat> Sheikha Nawar Al Qasimi, she was very supportive, and uh, everyone at uh, Saf uh, Sharjah Art Foundation, who I worked with uh, since the beginning of the project until uh, yesterday, and, and hopefully there will be more uh, opportunities in the future as well. So, yeah. thank you, Baba. Um, so, It's just, um, okay, so we thought to start, or at least I thought that we should start at the beginning with your most recent project, Last Scene, which is a, a, com a composite image, really, of 50 different photographs that you'll find in Gallery 4. And as you start to kind of move into the space of the image, it starts to kind of unfold fragments and stories. And our imaginations begin to wander. And many other stories emerge from that. But the, but the actual truth, I suppose, is something that is held in the secret cavern that is Herrera Sarkissian's mind. And I wanted to just begin by asking about the genesis of this project, Last Scene, which is something that you've worked on since 2018 to just really recently. So this project, uh, I started in 2018. It, it was, uh, I was uh, reading an article about, uh, it was in The Guardian, and the article was about uh, the war in Bosnia and uh, the Balkans, actually. Uh, and there was, uh, in this article, there was a paragraph where it was covering the issue of the people who disappeared. And uh, the families are still struggling to know the truth where the remains of these uh, uh, disappeared, like family members are, st uh, <clears throat> Are. So, and from there I just started to uh, my research about this project where I just came up with the idea of uh, look, look for families uh, in, all, in, in different parts of the world. I, I had it very, uh, I had many des destinations in my mind when I started this project. Uh, but because of COVID, uh, later it shrank uh, bit by bit, and also some politics also involved in some of the countries where uh, I didn't have the access. So the, the idea of this project was uh, look for families who have a member who disappeared, uh, and and then ask them where they remember seeing the family, the, the member who disappeared for the last time in the exact same house that they are still living until today. And I did this project in five different countries. Uh, I started with Lebanon and then Brazil, uh, Argentina and then Kosovo and uh, Bosnia. And for me, this this project, it, it has a very, uh, Emotion, very big emotional uh, value, and also it was very challenging for me. Also, at some stage, uh, when I first started this project in in Beirut, actually it was the second day. I I I couldn't listen to the to the stories of these mothers who lost someone, uh, who lost their sons or husbands, but mainly they were sons. So in the second day, I thought, I, I, I cannot do this anymore. I had to stop because it's really too much. But then I just pulled myself and continued this journey. And I started looking for these families and listened to their stories, recorded uh, their stories one by one uh, individually. And then I photographed the space where they remember uh, seeing and the idea of this project is about the phantom of the of the person who disappeared, who is not dead, who is not alive. 
and he lives in that space still with the rest of the family. And that was for me, it, it was quite, uh, the whole project was built upon. Now, I chose this specific image because when I looked at it, I assumed that the person that you were photographing was either a groom who had just been married and that the family had left the, the pressed suit and dress against this cabinet or vice versa. And it left me with uh, an incredible sense of melancholy, but it's actually um, even more complex than that. Could you talk about this specific one? So the, the story of this uh, image is actually, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's, it, it was in Bosnia and this uh, woman, she lost her four sons and husband. So they found the remain of her husband and one son and the, the other three are still uh, missing until today. And it, 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 the story was a story of humiliation and, uh, and uh, suffering as well. So when this thing, uh, how it started, how they were really uh, kidnapped. And so what happened is this woman, she turned the house into a museum so people can come and listen to her story and also see in reality how does it feel to live in this space where she is still hoping to find the remains of her son of her sons so one of the sons here he just got married before he was kidnapped and and they just had a new bear, uh, born child and so when the son disappeared the wife took her son and left because she couldn't handle anymore uh, staying in this place so she she left and this woman stayed with the uh, in this space where she covered everything in three uh, in the other three rooms with plastics so she can keep it clean and intact so other people can come and visit i want to ask about the composition of the image because unlike many of us who take photographs on our cellular devices, you have continued to use the large format camera, which, is a, a, which we will come to, which is a, an experience that was learnt early on in your youth. And that is something that is uh, uh, particularly different than uh, taking many digital photos. Can you explain to us how you decide to frame the shot and the experience of taking the photo and also the fact that you only take one only ever took one single image ever in any of these places correct so uh, that's correct i only took one image per uh, story uh, so when when the person uh, <clears throat> They indicate, for instance, where the room was. So I enter the room and I just set up my tripod and the camera and I just take one picture. I don't move around. And uh, I think in that, in that time, I, I was not very much interested about how the look, how the space looked like, or I didn't want to make it look beaut beautiful space. I did not have that interest at all. What I wanted is just just to say that the person was living here and not anymore. And f for me, I think this is a stronger image than just making, usually with digital cameras uh, or with phones, we take, if we go enter in space, we start taking pictures without even uh, having thoughts about the space. We just take pictures and leave. And I, 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 I don't do that. I usually just go and take, I spend as much time as possible behind the camera and see exactly what I want to photograph and then I take the picture. And one of the things that I was also talking to you about before was the experience of doing this project over the course of the pandemic where you were, I was constantly seeing you you know, in quarantine, having to go back and forth to these various sites. You also mentioned that there were other locations where you were unable to go due to the pandemic, such as Chile and um, I believe... What, Johannesburg. And Johannesburg. And, but also, one question that 
comes up, I think, for some people is how you negotiated the ethical aspects of the work, which is to say that you're going into these spaces um, that are incredibly charged emotionally. Do you see your role as, as a person helping create an archive, helping foster a sense of restitution? How do you articulate that sense? When, for me, uh, I mean, in this project, my, uh, what I wanted to bring up is the pain of these families that are constantly living. Uh, I, I, I didn't, I, I, it's, I, I don't want to document, uh, and because this uh, kind of stories, it's all around the world, and it happens every day, and, and for me, this was also, uh, it's, it was, saying that when the war is finished, it's, it's not completely finished, because this is what's uh, one, one of the leftovers, uh, the causes of the war. So in, in, in that sense, I don't see myself, uh, w when I met these people, it, it, it was more, I, I tried to get as close I, as I could, uh, because they always saw me as a stranger, which is completely normal. And I try to be as open as possible with the project and with what I want to achieve by doing this. And in almost all the cases, they completely understood and also supported because it's so many of them said, we had so many journalists, for instance, in Bosnia or in Lebanon. I mean, in Lebanon, it's, it's almost uh, over 35 years now, the civil war. They said we had enough talking to journalists and nothing happens. They just come, listen to the story, they go to put it on the newspaper and that's it. And for me, I saw it, this is another form of reaching also another uh, uh, different public as well. And there was, however, one incident, I believe, in Northern Ireland where you weren't able to bridge that connection. Can you tell us about that? So in Northern Ireland, the total of missing people, I think there was uh, 14, and after uh, the agreement, uh, it was, I think, initiated by Bill, Bill Clinton. Uh, so th they indicated where the bo seven bodies uh, are, and s no, I think more than seven. I think uh, in total, there, there was four bodies left. They were not indicated where. So I went, I, I tried to communi uh, communicate with this organization in Ireland where they take care of these people. Uh, they, they were never responsive to my email, so I just hopped on a plane and I went to Dublin and knocked on the door and said, listen, I wrote an email to you and I really want to discuss this. Uh, she said, sure, uh, we, we will help you. And of course, when I came back to uh, to my studio, I emailed them, I never heard back from them again. And I think that's an important point to emphasize, is that it's a, it's a practice where there is a concept, there is a research process, but it's also about a relationship that's formed, and often you, you jump on planes and, and, or trains or walk to spaces that may be close to you, and I think that's what makes uh, the practice, those things aren't necessarily always evident to people, which I think is important to articulate. But also this piece, I think, is, as, as the most recent piece, is particularly poignant at this moment in history because it is very much about what it means to be living with the memory of a ghost that is somewhere between life and death, un unable to be declared dead, where one is unable to grieve or, or move forward. And the melancholy of that very much speaks to, I think, the age of emotion that we've started to find ourselves in, especially with the pandemic, with the, with the awareness of um, our vulnerability as, as, as humans on a mass scale. And I wondered if you could reflect before I move to the past, about the timing of the piece at this moment in history? When I started, when I continued doing this project even during the COVID, I, I, to be honest, I didn't think about the pandemic. 
I thought more about these families and that I really wanted to finish this piece. It's such an important uh, project for me to, uh, because I started it in 2018. And uh, of course, with the uh, support of Sharjah Art Foundation, uh, I was able to uh, continue uh, the project. And it, it never came into my mind that, oh, there is the pandemic, I have to stop. I really, I, I tried to block that bit and whenever I had a leeway to just get out and travel, I did, I did go and uh, continue the project. But you did choose to stop when your emotions finally took over. Yeah, and that, that was at the last uh, destination when I went to uh, Kosovo. And for, for me, Kosovo was, uh, it hit me the hardest listening to the stories, because uh, people live on these sites where mass people were killed. Not only one person who disappeared, but they were killed and disappeared. So they live until today, since the 90s, they live on that same spot. And for me, I, I think that was a sign for me that I, I couldn't process anymore. And I said to myself, I, I think I should stop here because there, there was a point where I was afraid sitting with these families when continuing this project, sitting with them and not listening to their stories anymore because I completely blocked my... Uh, I, 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 I was afraid also on myself, uh, in a sense. Post-traumatic stress of a sort. Oops. So, to go all the way back now to one of your earliest works, 2006, Unfinished. Now, my, I, I nicknamed this piece the Rothko, which I don't think is something that you like. But uh, it, uh, the reason that I, said, I always said this was because when I encountered the image even digitally, it reminded me of the... the, the the Rothko room in the Tate Modern that is installed and other Rothko experiences, but the, the piece has nothing to do with that. It actually has to do with something very specific which you have chosen to abstract. Can you tell us about Unfinished? So uh, Unfinished, uh, this was the beginning of my artistic career uh, where I switched from taking uh, pictures in the old streets of Damascus and uh, traveling all around Syria uh, on, on a weekend and just photograph. And this, this was for me the beginning where I was trying to make, to build up something uh, based on feelings uh, more. And uh, so I, I got this, uh, I started to look for places that are anonymous and they don't have any sort of identity or uh, restrictions where I can just be on my own in the space and imagine. And uh, for me this, I think visually it's always, when I look at these photos back, it always reminds me when I uh, enter uh, churches and how the light in inside the church, the natural light, how it just plays around in the space. And I was always uh, struck by this uh, sort of lighting that goes, and I think it's something that stayed in my memory, I, and I try to apply it in my images here. Can I just, again, just go back to this and say that the first time, if you see the entire, the, the series in, in Gallery 3, the, 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 the sense that you might feel in relation to it might completely shift. But when I first saw it, I believed it to have been digital, photoshopped, this light was artificial, etc. And you said n no, and uh, I didn't quite understand or believe you. And it took, I think, a year and a half from that point till you set up the camera, made me the kind of phantom and the, the thing, the, the whatever it's hid called. you underneath. Yes, hid me underneath behind the lens, and the image is actually up, so it's upside down with these bars. And as a, I felt very naive as someone who proclaims to be a historian of images to to not have experienced that. But 
so be it. How, um, how do you feel about circulating images now? These large format images that are one shot, that involve an incredibly sophisticated imagining and playing with an analog form in an age that is digital, where people can manipulate images to create whatever they want things to look like? I mean, uh, the, the difference between the digital and the analog for me, it's you take so many digital pictures and you really look at them very quickly. And for the analog, when I take an analog picture, I really look really very long time through the camera and see what I exactly want to have on the print, I take a picture. So the person who will look at it spends same amount of time looking at the pictures rather than just swiping uh, and go through it really uh, quickly. Uh, it's, I mean, there is that factor and there's also the other factor that when it comes to my work and the stories that I work uh, with, I don't think people want really to see any more uh, images that uh, I don't know. Maybe that's not the. Did yeah. you say what you want to say? What you want? No, no. It's it's. I think when we talk about image quantity, it's it's. Uh, I I I try to make as less as possible, and. Uh, so people can also have a space to think and to uh, wander in the, the, the story, also the, the visual as well. And I think that was something that working with you was very surprising to me, is that you could go on an, ex let's call it an excursion, but it's not, I mean, on a research trip for an extensive period, come back with one single image, such as, say, Brazil, which is featured, represented in last scene with only one image, and that to you was an incredible success because it was so perfectly uh, um, defined, if you will. And that it, it was in such stark contrast to everything else that we see. I mean, there are probably more images produced this today of us walking around on mobile phones than you might have produced in uh, the last three years. But that's that's the difference. And we maybe we'll come back to the relationship of this medium to the region as well, which I think would be an interesting thing. And to stick with 2006, you also at this time went to um, produce this incredible series called In Between, which is shown almost in its entirety for the first time here at Charger Art Foundation in Gallery 4. And it's a post-Soviet view of Yerevan that is blanketed in snow, where we're not entirely sure what we're looking at and why. Can you tell us? So, so this, uh, when I did this trip, it was for me the first time I go to Armenia as an, as an adult. And f being an Armenian, uh, from the diaspora, we've always raised, uh, we were brought up by the historical, uh, historical images of Armenia rather than the current situation. <clears throat> so uh, always, we were also taught how to be proud of our history, uh, our identity, our language, that we should really fight to keep it uh, living. So when I went to Armenia in that year, for me, it, that, this was quite uh, a big shock for me because what I saw, it was completely the opposite. It was poverty, corruption, and people were barely surviving. I mean, back then, like salary, a journalist uh, would get paid $3 a month. And for me, this was really shocking. Uh, and I started to think that all these Armenians diaspora who go travel from all around the world every year to visit the motherland, but who never, nobody comes across and talk about how it is now. 
And for me, that was the moment where I started to think, uh, how can I just bring this up in a way so people can even, like, especially Armenians, start thinking about this. And I, for, for that reason here, I used, in most of these images, I used snow as a white translucent fabric that covers the city, the countryside, mountains, where it prevents us from seeing the reality and only we are able to see the whiteness, the brightness of the snow. And so we cannot see anything else. I mean, just to put in context, uh, so you are, were born in Damascus in 1973. Uh, your grandfather had moved to Syria as after the beginning of the Armenian genocide. And uh, the vision of Armenia uh, and your home, his, your grandfather's hometown was a, a picture of imagination that you've often articulated, which we will come back to at the very end. And with that, with the title in between, I also wanted to prod further and inquire about whether you have felt that the, the, the ideas around uh, a national identity have been, are, are continue to be important within your work now, reflecting almost more than 15 years almost later since, I mean, this work actually began its genesis in 2001 when you first went as an adult. So how do you feel now about that idea? Uh, I think now, living in London too, it's completely lost in translation situation where when somebody asks, where are you from? My question always depends on what is the context. So if I am on a plane sitting next to someone, says, where are you from? I would not say I am from Damascus. I would say I'm from London. Uh, so it's, 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 it's very confusing for me. Uh, and it, it's, it's also funny to say when I go to Armenia, there's, so, there's a big difference between our culture as Western Armenians and Eastern Armenians, because Eastern Armenians are more uh, towards the Russians and uh, Western Armenians are more the Middle East, uh, uh, Eastern Anatolia, where we originally came from, uh, food, music, everything. So it's, it's, it's quite, uh, I mean, if I go to Turkey, I, I, I see so many faces that look like me more than when I go to Armenia, for instance. So it, 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 it is very confusing. I think 10 minutes, okay, well, we'll, we'll see about that. Um, Execution Square is perhaps your most famous work. Uh, I hate to say things like that. I shouldn't have said that, I apologize. Um, but this is a, a piece that, that I mentioned at the beginning that was first shown here in 2009 and acquired by Sharjah Art Foundation before it really started to capture the imagination of many people around the world. And I chose this specific image because it's the most uh, it was the most kind of, um, had the least features, if you will. And I feel that many people in this space will know what this is about. Maybe you could tell us the entry point into it and maybe going back to the childhood memory. So I was 11 years old, uh, going to school, uh, in like it was 6.37 in the morning uh, by bus and I was standing up and we reached to this square which was near to my father's shop. Uh, it's called Maysad Square, where I saw these three uh, things were hanging. Uh, and when we got closer, I, I just realized there are t these are three men were hanged. Uh, they were topless and they had this white sheet covering uh, their top and there was like writing on this sheet paper, the name of the person, date of birth, and the crime they committed and the punishment, why they are punished. And, I mean, I, and when I, I'm at this age seeing these things, I think it's something that you can never erase from memory. It just got, uh, it gets stuck. Uh, so years later in 2008, when I was, uh, 
back to Damascus, I just came up with this idea, maybe by just taking pictures of these squares, especially the, the, the one I witnessed, might help me to erase and get rid of this image of these three hanged bodies, because that was an, such an awful image. I still remember their eyes was, uh, were wide open, and we, had just, we were just had an encounter at that day. But my mission failed, because I photographed these squares, just trying to convince my, uh, myself, because I thought photography is a medium to prove something, but it did not. And in a sense, you ended up creating an archive for something that you were trying to forget, but it also points to the fact that you often do not include human beings in your work, which is a, a decision that, of course, sometimes you veer away from, but perhaps you can elucidate the choice of not having people in the frame. Uh, I always think in, in my work, whenever there is a human, uh, it, might, it will distract the viewer from looking at the picture frame, which is the, the story that I am trying to reveal or point at. And, th uh, and that's one of the reasons. And the second reason, uh, I always had difficulties photographing people. And I remember at my father's shop, whenever somebody, a client came and asked for portraiture, I would call my dad to take the pictures because I, I couldn't do it. I could not look in the eyes. And this is something I think uh, it stayed in my work too. I try to avoid and not have this direct uh, contact. Maybe then it makes sense to go then to one of the few works. If, actually, it's the only work where you, one of two works that you've ever made that features um, human beings that are not you, which is Zibiba from 2007, which was made, produced in Cairo. Could you say a little about this? So this, this one, uh, this project, I, w I was in Cairo and I was really visually struck with this prayer mark that people, I, I saw on uh, just people's forehead, on uh, mainly men, not female. And uh, I, for me, this was, at, like after a few days, it became really something where I only, I was only looking at this mark, the shape, how how is it formed, and I stopped looking at faces. For me, when I did this project, I was not interested in doing portraiture, but I was more interested about th this stain, that somehow it creates another uh, a space for us to think, you know. And it, the project, it was quite, uh, I mean, the way I did it, I rented, uh, three commercial uh, shops in the different uh, sp uh, parts of Cairo, and I set up my studio and I asked everyone to come in and photograph, take a picture of, uh, of them. And were the subjects coming to you to be photographed out of a kind of celebratory um, profession of their devotion, or was it simply curiosity? How was the inter engagement with them? Well, the engagement, I mean, the fact that I am from Syria and I spoke Arabic, that was a very big factor uh, to facilitate this, having a communication with the, with the passers-by who never saw me before. And, and for some, uh, we said we want to photograph the prayer mark, and for some, we said we just want to photograph the, uh, the faces. To continue a kind of opposite, you know, the absence. This is a series called Background from 2012, which is also on view at Jamil Art Center in a different form and was shown in Art Dubai in 2012, I believe, as well. And this is actually part of a larger project, but these six Duratrans speak to a specific interest of yours, which is a disappearance of the medium. Can you speak to that? So the, 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 this project is called Background, where I basically travel to uh, five or six cities in the Middle East and documented, uh, I photographed these backdrops they used uh, uh, that we find in uh, studios 
uh, in all in the cities where families used to go during uh, festivities like Christmas, Eid, uh, wherever, where they, they all dress up and they go to the local uh, studio just to get a souvenir picture. And I, I was always fascinated with this idea of backdrop that I think for most of the people, especially the ones who could not travel that time or go anywhere, I think for them it provided a sort of journey because most of the, the backdrops were images from the Swiss Alps or German lake or... Uh, so it, it, it was quite uh, interesting. And w with the appearance of the digital technology, this all changed. Uh, and what the shops now, the studios started to do is just Photoshop. After they take a picture of the client, they just Photoshop. So this dreaming aspect of the of this whole process completely disappeared. And, and this was something really sad for me because this is also what it says about the profession of photography because studios were part of our culture in, in the region and it's something that does not exist anymore. Which brings us to, I suppose, the genesis. This is a work called My Father and I, and I, I specifically chose uh, these two images and juxtapose them against each other. So you began your education as a as a youth with your baba in the in in a studio who whose lab Dream Color was the first photocolor lab in Syria, correct? Can you talk us specifically through this work, however, which is almost about uh, the end of what was many, what were many years of fantastical imagination with and around your father and the studio. So this was my family's business and my father, he opened this lab in 1977 and it was the first color lab in Syria. Uh, and back then when the color films appeared, uh, they came up, uh, they used to send the films to Lebanon. And my father was a wedding photographer and uh, he did so, uh, all sorts of commercial photography. And uh, uh, Lebanon was always open in, 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 uh, when it comes to technology and importing uh, technologies, all these things. So my father, when, whenever they took pictures, they had to send the films to, to Beirut to develop the films and it took like one week uh, so they had all to wait uh, uh, until they received the films back, the, fo the pictures. So he always wanted, had this dream to open a lab in Damascus, and that's why he called it Dream Color first. And uh, basically, this is the place where I grew up, and I uh, spent all my uh, summer holidays in the, in the lab. I learned everything about photography and also about life uh, as well. And when I finished high school, uh, I just wanted to start working and take over my family's business. But uh, when I left in 2008, uh, I, I left to Holland. Uh, and since my siblings were never interested in, in the continuing this uh, business, my father decided just to close the lab and rent the space uh, uh, <clears throat> so he can make an earning from it. And this was a very sad moment for me because immediately I started thinking about all these memories I had from childhood until uh, I left. And, and I decided to go to Damascus and ask my father to photograph me as a last client in, in this lab uh, before he shuts down the... And we had this very uh, silent photographic session where we did not speak at all uh, or we did not express any feelings but it was such a tense moment for both of us that uh, that I, I don't think I will ever forget. And uh, yes, the reason I chose these images of you is because there's a, there's a scar on your neck which you... A cut. Which you, which, which, can you tell us about that? I basically, I just, 
uh, cut myself when I was shaving because I was so intense before going uh, there. It had a, such an important... Uh, this space has a, such an important uh, meaning to me, and I, I was so uh, uh, traumatized just to sit in front of my, my father and uh, asking him to take pictures of me. You, you've also spoken about this work as one of um, muted gestures that you were trying to preserve as well over time. Can you say something about that? Gestures. Gestures of photography, the practice of photography, the 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 poses, the positions the, of the studio. Yeah, it's 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 this tradition that is same as the backgrounds that is disappeared. Uh, I mean, my father was very good at because it it was his uh, his profession, just uh, asking clients how to sit, and so I went through that ex uh, experience also with him tilting and shifting the face and telling me where to look. So, yeah. And as well, I think it's, we're gonna go to the last image now. It's um, very much about the, a kind of personal uh, restitution because in a sense you, you left first before Holland to France and came back and that's when you realized that you, really wanted to leave, as I understand, and went and went off to, to, to form that international career. And, and in a way, I assume that it, although it was difficult, that in retrospect, it, it was a kind of closure, could you say? Uh, yeah, it, it is. I mean, I still have a, 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 I mean, this place, it's really, uh, it means a lot. I mean, uh, it, it has more uh, meaning to me than our house, you know, because I, I met so many people and work with them, and we built up friendships for so many uh, years. Uh, and uh, and everything I do now, I it's it's because of this space that I uh, I am what, what I am now. And I was asking about closure because this is a, a picture that you took um, for another new commission that you're working on, which is um, called Sweet and Sour, which is gonna be in the next leg of the show at the Bonafantin Museum, commissioned by them. And it's a story really that also involves your father. Perhaps you could tell us why you chose this image and how it relates to the project. So th this is, uh, these are uh, small pears uh, that are called shakiq and they exist only in Aleppo. And, uh, and this, I found this tree in my grandfather's village uh, in, in a region in Turkey, it's called Sasun, where we originally come from. Uh, I've been there a couple of weeks ago, and this is the new project that uh, I'm currently work on, where I went to see where my grandfather originally came from, and where he lost his family, his wife and son, that were killed, and his rest of his rest of his family were also uh, all killed in that same village, and so I went to visit this village which is called Khansorik and in Armenian Khansorik it means small apples and in that village I found this tree where they still have these uh, small pears which were the seeds were brought from Aleppo and my grandfather used to work in Aleppo during the genocide and he could not go back and see his family and look for his family because he was not allowed and for me this was uh, it, it, for me this was a uh, a very long and difficult emotional journey to the past that we as a family still live in today. So, I mean, the idea is to take these pictures and show it to my father. And yeah, who has never been there. And then we will see what emerges from that. And um, I'd like to invite uh, any of the audience members who have questions to 
raise their hand and there's a microphone to the left that shall greet you. And don't be shy. Oh, just here. Okay. Okay, thank you so much for an enlightening uh, presentation. So the question that I have is, are there images that whose meanings have changed over time? For example, was there an image that you took with a specific emotion, and then the emotions with that image changed over time? So if you can identify one and tell us more about that. Uh, I, I don't think I have any of these images that I took, the meaning has changed. I, because it's still something people, I mean, all these stories that I work on, it's, it, it happened in the past, but it's something that we still live in the present. I think that's very precise, which you always are. <laughs> Question here, please. Um, so when I'm looking at these series of photographs, I'm thinking, you know, about absence. I'm thinking end, history from the title. Uh, but when you're introducing the photography studio with your father, and the name of the studio was, I think, Dream Color or Dream Something, um, it sparked the question about: Have you captured in any of your work a dream series, something about? prospective or capturing people that were imagining another place um, because again a lot of this is looking back in absence and loss and I'm just wondering if you've ever done a, a dream series I, I think this last project is uh, it kind of uh, deals with uh, what you have mentioned because for my father it's been always his dream to go back to his uh, father's village and because we live, we don't know anything, we don't have any visuals uh, uh, of his village, where he ca came from. We only know songs, stories. And I, I think now I'm trying to do this connection and make my father's dream come true and showing the, where I have been to the village and the region as well. It's kind of fulfilling his uh, wish. Uh, Anouk, here. I was wondering, <coughs> why did you want to take photos of um, pears for uh, your father? Because it's it's something came from Aleppo, the the pear tree where my grandfather used to work. So I had this 1% of doubt that he might have brought this seed one of the days that he went back before he got stuck in Aleppo. Is there a question up front here? Actually, one point and one question. I think he battled the idea that he was always worried about not having a human in his pictures, but in Zubiba, he had so many humans, but I failed to look at any of the faces because the Zubiba was so much in my face. My question is, at the beginning of the session, Herrera, I mean, most of us, I was lucky enough to be exposed to chess when I was young, so I could easily guess that Herrera is Armenian. But um, he said, I went to sites of war aftermath as a stranger. And then throughout the session, I discovered that he has been a stranger all his life to the studio of his father, to his city, to Irvin, Northern, <laughs> Eastern, Western. He's been saying a stranger in so many different Formats. So uh, my question is, I'm yet to see an artist who's not confused, the way that you described it, about his identity. So what can you tell us about that? I mean, how much of being a stranger in your own life, uh, you call the studio of your father more dear to your heart than your own house, how much of this do you tribute 
to your uh, experience. Heavy questions, bated breath. Uh, I think I need to think about this. <laughs> Uh, I really don't. Uh, yeah, I, I think eventually, I mean, for me now, I just realize home, it's, it's the place where I have a roof on top of my head. And now it doesn't matter where I am. And for me, I was not born in my own country. I was born in Syria, where we always felt, uh, uh, I won't say strangers, but there was always this kind of, uh, that we were never from, you know? It's, it's, it's also a sign of, uh, because usually that's also what minorities do, because they need to keep their identity, their language, their, uh, uh, so many things, so they kind of try to be protective. Uh, but I think that's not a, a, a good way to do things because in a way you isolate your, yourself. And when I started going abroad, I started to be more open and realizing how people live, how open they are, and how we were closed. I don't know if that answers your question. I mean, I, I don't feel I am stranger because what I do as work, I share with everyone. And in that sense, I don't feel stranger because everything I do, it's we all share feel with feelings. And in that sense, I think I don't feel myself a stranger to you. Uh, I would say that one of the things that I often say about your work is that you're an archeologist and the storyteller. And what you often do is you dig into the emotional fabric of a situation and bring that out for us to see. And actually it's within the ability which to code switch, as it were, between being a Londoner, a Syrian, an Armenian, or any other number of things, a man, a woman, a whatever. It is that you want to be in that moment that you're able to also access specific emotions. And I think it's a very, um, I think that increasingly I, we're, we're all strangers wherever we go, but actually through the act of emotional connection is where I think we find home. And I think that's something that's very pervasive in the work. Last question. Okay, I have three hands, so I don't know what to do. Someone, someone decide, because I can't decide. I have one hand here, one hand in the middle, so whoever. Wow, last question, so no pressure. Um, uh, so you talked about uh, taking a long time and uh, clicking one photo about the composition and everything, but has there, any, has there been any time where take two hours, click one photo, and then you just walk away and you discover like, oh man, this, this actually, this is much better. Like this, this. Uh, no, I, I never took two hours because I'm visiting families, so I can't stay two hours <laughs> in there. No, yeah, I, I but The question no. is, uh, has there been any uh, times where you click a photo and then you just m walk away and then you discover another angle that no. might better tell the no, story. No, because I'm so much focused on the on the on revealing the pain no matter what angle you put in the room, you take a picture uh, of that room, the pain is still the same, it doesn't change. Well, I don't know if that's the p say what you said again, the pain in the room. So let's say that Harar Sarkissian's The Other Side of Silence is not just about the pain in the room. It's about how the pain in the room can be 
archived and thought of in a way that can build and bridge connections between people across cultures. I called, I gave you the proposition to call the show The Other Side of Silence, not as a binary proposition, but to say that although the images may be silent, although you may at times be very, very silent and never answer the questions, uh, that there is so many variable possibilities and ways to read and interpret and engage with the work because ultimately it is about the singular experience of an affective emotional connection and for that i thank you so much and all of us thank you for sharing with us the generosity of your work letting us have the privilege of bringing together this mid-career survey it's been a it's been a, a, a huge team effort and I would love to just have a massive round of applause for Harar Sarkisian. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Amal.